Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back to Grand Rounds. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. John Ho, who's a clinical immunologist and allergist at Mount Sinai Hospital. He received his medical degree from Yale University and subsequently completed internal medicine residency training at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, followed by allergy and immunology fellowship at Mount Sinai. He sees adult and pediatric patients with primary immune disorders, and his research focuses on the characterization of these disorders, as well as bringing novel therapies to this patient population. His research is supported by the Academy, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ho for Grand Round. All right. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you so much for having me. Um, so today, my thought was, you know, instead of focusing on my research or the nitty gritty of immunology, you know, I'll, talk, I'll focus more on what I wish I knew as a medical resident and what I think would be important for general internists or other subspecialties to know about immunology. Um, I don't have any conflict of interest relevant for this talk. Um, so my goal today is really to help you understand how primary immune defect can present, and it's not exactly how you imagine based on med school or even medicine boards. Um, we'll also review what's new in the field to help you take care of the, some of the patients that may show up in your clinic. Um, so starting off with a case, uh, this is one of our patients, and he was 40 years old when he first presented. Um, he's a high school coach, and then he's been having fever, cough, and tachycardia for a week. Uh, in the ER, he had a temperature. Um, his heart rate was 110. Elevate by count, um, otherwise normal labs. And they got a check x ray, which showed right upper lobe pneumonia. His viral PCR was negative. You know, so we've all admitted or seen patients with pneumonia. Um, it's one of the most common reasons for admissions alongside cardiovascular disease or diabetes, for example. And probably a lot of us even have a smart phrase for it. You know, it becomes pretty routine for us, you know. We'll start them on antibiotics. We'll see whether they need to be admitted, get culture. Most of the time they do well, you know, they may just get antibiotics at home or they'll be in hospital for a few days and then they were sent home. You know, so for this guy, however, if you ask a bit further, he actually had another pneumonia earlier that year and he also reports problem with recurrent rhinosinusitis. So his primary care doctor thought that was you know, kind of odd, so sent to allergy immunology, initially more for rhinitis evaluation, and his allergy test was negative. Um, but what turned out it was they sent an antibody, and he barely had any antibody in him. So a normal IgG is supposed to be 600 to 1400. His was only 100, and he had no IgA um, and no IgM. Now he actually was, you know, kind of uh, got off a bit lucky. Um, this is another patient of ours. He also happened to be 40 year old and he presented much more severely. So he showed up with empyema uh, with culture growing strep pneumo and he ended up needing prolonged chest tube drainage and decortication. Um, this is his chest CT. So you can see it's quite dramatic. You know, one side of his lung is basically completely wiped out. And perhaps not too surprising, if you take a look at his antibody level, his IgG level is even lower. So um, I thought for today, um, it's a one long talk, I'm gonna split it into four mini ones. I feel like with YouTube shorts and TikTok, our attention span is shorter and shorter these days. So hopefully you'll get away with at least like four easy talks and then come up with four main points. Um, so let's first talk about what we learned in med school. And I think for most of us, honestly, including myself, this was the extent of my knowledge for immunodeficiency. Uh, it's basically that, that one or two pages from step one. I think some of us may think it's low you at that point of the board prep and just skipped it as well. Um, so I thought we'll at least go over a few of them at first. Um, and I think it's common when you think about primary immunodeficiency, this is what comes to mind, you know, cases like the bubble boy. Um, so if you're not familiar, his name was David Vetter. So he was born in the 1970s with something called severe combined immunodeficiency. 
So he was basically born without an immune system. And unfortunately, what happened was they couldn't find a bone marrow match for him. Um, so he actually lived in the bubble for 12 years. Um, they actually set up a very sophisticated filtration system for him with many different rooms. Um, and he lived there for 12 years. Um, they even set up a space suit for him. So, you know, once in a while, he'd be able to go outside and play frisbee. Um, so he finally got transplanted when he was 12 years old. Uh, but unfortunately, um, he got exposed to EBV during the process and then developed EBV lymphoma four months later and passed away. Um, so I think it's easy from the board book and this case to, to think that immunodeficiency is really a pediatric issue. Um, but I think one of the things I, I kind of want to change our mindset about is that's not really quite the case in reality. So if we take a look example at primary antibody deficiency, which is the most common uh, problem out there, if you take a look at this study, the medium age of reported symptom onset is actually 20, like the first time they had pneumonia, for example. And uh, that's in pink here. And the medium age of diagnosis is actually 35 years old. So squarely in our arena in the internal medicine segment. Um, the, as you can see, this unfortunate long diagnostic delay, usually around nine years to a decade. Um, and if we take the other end of the age spectrum, for example, there's actually a condition called Good Syndrome, which is a situation where you lose your B cell antibodies after thymoma, and the median age of that onset is actually six years old. Um, so much later, not necessarily a pediatric issue. Um, and I think this misconception and diagnostic delay actually has a big impact for the patients. You know, this is one of the patients that show up in our clinic. You know, the way he present was he's actually at work and then one day he's climbing up ladders and he couldn't even make it without being so out of breath. And when we check his antibodies, um, they were basically non-existent. Um, so I think it's always kind of sad when you look at this chest CT you kind of know that, you know, they already have gotten so much lung damage from infection and inflammation, and it's not gonna last them so much longer. You know that you're not gonna live probably beyond 30, 40 years without a lung transplant. Um, so if you can imagine if this kid was diagnosed at age 35, you know, he probably will have so much fibrosis at that point where it would be irreversible. Um, so it's, I think something that we need to know about. Um, so I'll make it, Nice and simple review what we kind of know already, um, kind of what big groups will end up uh, immune deficiency we should know about, at least from step one. So I think the most common, like I said, is antibody deficiencies. So for these patients, how they really show up is sinus infection, lung infection. Uh, the classic bugs you'll see are strep pneumo and haemophilus influenza. It's kind of interesting, it's almost always these bugs. So for some reason, our antibody is so important in targeting these polysaccharide capsules and getting rid of them for us. Um, they are also susceptible to more chronic GI infections. So, you know, you and I, if we get like a cruise ship virus, norovirus, we clear pretty fast, but some of these patients, it lasts, can last for several years, many, many decades, um, many years. I have some patients who have had chronic norovirus for five, six years now, um, and it's actually terrible. They just have ongoing chronic diarrhea. Um, they can also be susceptible for Giardia, for example. Um, I think the most common example of this is uh, common variable immunodeficiency. Or actually, um, about one in 200 patient, uh, people, at least in certain um, European ancestry, they actually have IgA deficiency as well and presents with a milder version of this. So you will encounter it uh, in your career. Um, the second big category are phagocyte defects. So you guys probably know this already. The most famous one is chronic granulomatous disease. It's a condition where your neutrophil basically doesn't make enough bleach to kill the bacteria for you. Um, and they have a very specific way to present. Um, so they tend to get soft tissue, deep organ, severe infection. So this guy had a giant abscess in his liver. Um, we had one patient who ended up growing uh, fungi from brackish water in his leg muscles and ended up needing amputation. So it gets quite severe. Um, they can also get pneumonia or osteomyelitis. Um, so what bugs get to these patients? Well, they're usually staph aureus, 
aspergillus, you know, brachydaria, serratia, nocardia. Um, I don't know if anyone here is going to ID. If you think about going to ID, definitely you know, remember this list. Uh, because if you see someone with a deep infection with one of these bugs, definitely worth it to get us involved. They probably have some sort of neutrophil uh, problem. And the last, I think we pretty much know these pretty well, how they present from our BMT patients um, or from people's, some people with end-stage HIV patients. You know, third group is T cell defects, so they get persistent thrush. Um, and these are not just kind of thrush you get from asthma inhalers. You know, these are thrush that are really difficult to treat and can be uh, invasive. They get fungal infections, opportunistic infection like PJP, which we will know about. Um, common virus can get them really sick, or sometimes even live bacterial vaccine can make them really sick as well. Um, the classic case is like the bubble boy here uh, with skid. Or in adult, it's actually a form of HIV negative CD4 lymphopenia, uh, which for a long time people don't know what causes that. Okay. Questions so far? All right. We're already uh, a quarter done. So, uh, second talk. So, side door, back entrance, and secret elevators. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, so, I think this is what most people think of immunology in internal medicine. We're probably hidden away in the attic, you know, probably in our hammock, reading some immunology book and thinking about cells. That's how I thought about immunology before, before I signed up for it. Um, and I think it's actually kind of hard to get to us. You know, people don't, probably don't know we existed. And, you know, if you don't know, then you won't look into it. I think if you have a good primary care doctor, that's the most direct way to get to us. You know, if they notice you've been getting sick a lot or getting unusual infections. We also get referral from ID from very uh, severe cases. Um, but the reality is that a lot of these patients are actually already hidden elf elsewhere uh, in something that you, you might be interested in. Um, so we, they're probably already in hematology clinic, GI clinic, um, sometimes even rheumatology or allergy clinics. Um, and then there are sometimes different back doors to get to immunology. And that once in a while, we also get a very astute pathologist who never saw the patients, but they'll look at your slide and say, hey, one type of immune cells are not there at all, and they'll trigger a consult. So if you're lucky to get a really good pathologist you've never met before, uh, it could actually save your life. So let's go over some example of how uh, you may end up in your clinic in one of your specialty of interest. So let's take a look at hematology, for example. We know all about Evans syndrome, right? So it's autoimmune hemolytic anemia with immune thrombocytopenia and neutropenia. Um, so, you know, what happens, you know, if you have a group of patients who has had this for most of their life? So, a group of researchers decide to take a look at the patients who have had symptoms since they were less than six years old and see what's going on there. You know, do they just have Evans syndrome or do they have something else? Um, and turns out, I think it's quite interesting. So they sequence a group of these 80 patients and at the end, 65% of them actually have some sort of primary immune defect. And as you can see here, about 50 to 60% of these patients actually have quite low antibody that would benefit from uh, immunoglobulin treatments. Um, I put a list here, not for you to kind of go through what kind of genes they are, but more just kind of give you a variety of what it could be. So it could be, you know, B cell defects and T cell defects, and that can all show up as something um, that you think is just a hematological issue. And what happens when they take a step back, look a little bit broader, what they found was that you know, autoimmune conditions actually occurs up to 80 times more frequently in the primary immunodeficiency population than age match controls. Um, for things like ITP or hemolytic anemia, actually the risk factor is actually 120 times higher if the onset in childhood, um, so quite dramatic. Um, now, and let's take a look at one of the most common immunodeficiency, for example, um, common variable immunodeficiency. Uh, this is a disorder where your B cells don't mature properly and they have very low antibody overall. 
So you probably know this already. If you take a look at this, you will assume that most of their issue is sinus infection and pneumonia. Um, and so we took a look at that here. Um, just so happened in Mount Sinai, we actually have the biggest cohort of this in the world right here. We have over 700 plus patients uh, over the year. Uh, and this is not me, this is just the legacy that's um, here. Um, and so I took a look at this back in 2020 and say, hey, we have all these patients, what we think with immune deficiency, what do they actually look like? And turns out, yes, they do get infection, but another major problem they have is up to 60, 70% of them, they actually suffer from chronic inflammation and autoimmunity. So 30% of them have some sort of autoimmune hemolytic anemia or ITP. A lot of them have interstitial lung disease, lymphoproliferation. A lot of them actually present um, as kind of like Crohn's disease. And thankfully we have an excellent IBD group here who will pick this up for us. Um, they're also at risk for uh, lymphoma, for example, actually more common in female for some reason. And these are just some picture. And I like, I like this one, kind of dramatic, right? This is someone's gut and endoscopy, and this is the amount of lymphoproliferation they have in their gut. So it's, it's pretty uh, severe. Uh, these are some of their liver and spleen, so they get liver splenomegaly. Uh, this is some guy's organ. It's basically filled with uh, granulomas. So I kind of want to switch our concept from thinking uh, primary immune deficiency infection. It actually primary immune deficiency come with a lot of problem, a lot of other issues. Um, how about GI? I think probably some of you will go into GI. Um, you know, one of the bread and butter is Crohn's disease, IBD. So what happens when you take people who has had lifelong IBD? Um, so they define very early onset as people who has had it since they're six years old. And then they did the same thing. They sequenced their genes and see what they find. Turns out if you catch this group of patients, it's actually pretty high yield for some sort of primary immune deficiency. Um, just give you a variety. Again, it can affect the, something affect the epithelial barrier, something with phagocytes or something with their uh, regulatory T cell, something called IPAX. And if you look at them clinically, they present a little bit differently so if you start seeing IBD patients and you say, hey, you know, some of this doesn't add up quite right, you know, I do want you to keep it at the back of your mind. For example, if they start getting um, infections, you know, more sinopulmonary infections, if they have pretty severe disease that's fistulizing and you're not sure why, if they have other odd features like lymphoproliferation, um, other autoimmunity features like type 1 diabetes or autoimmune thyroid disease, and especially if you, they have had a long time, um, they probably have something else other than uh, Crohn's disease. Um, and why does it matter? And I think it, it matters because it actually changes your management. Um, you know, it may change the way you think about which biologics to recommend. You have to weigh the risk of infections from um, the benefit of immune suppressing them. And some of them may benefit from additional treatment like antimicrobial prophylaxis, immunoglobulin replacement, uh, for some of them, you can actually, if you know the exact gene defect, there's a targeted treatment for it. You know, a better side, you probably have seen this in a heme on clinic, but this is actually an exact protein that can be used to replace what these patients lack. And lastly, some of these patients, you know, no matter how much biologics you give them, they will still have severe Crohn's disease. And um, some of them, if they have a bigger immune defect, what they need at the end of the day is actually transplant. Um, and this is another way you can show up in an IBD clinic. So I think if you're a very good clinician, which I think we have a lot of excellent IBD doctors here, you'll take a look at pathology slide. Um, so our gut is supposed to fill with IgA. So this would be quite a bit of plasma cell there. And we sometimes we'll get referral from GI doctors because they'll look at the slides and say, hey, there's no plasma cell there. You know, something's off here. And it turns out, of course, you know, they have something called CPID that's causing their gut disease. And, you know, you probably, in that case, you probably would have saved someone's life. You probably would have saved someone from three or four hospitalization for pneumonia. Um, how about something much more common? You know, we use so much biologics now. You know, does it matter? Do they cause lasting immunodeficiency? So in room and hemonc, people actually use retox, rituximab all the time now. 
I think what people don't realize is that there's a subpopulation where rituximide almost works too well. So even after you stop it, you know, five to 10 years later, you measure the antibody level, they're still super low. For some reason, their B cell never recovers. Um, and, you know, one thing that we've noticed is that people don't usually check their antibody before giving rituximab. Um, and in those cases, when they show up to our clinic, it's kind of, it actually gets kind of hard to know what's the egg and what's the chicken. You know, do, are they getting sick from this um, because of rituximab, or are they, do they have some underlying immune deficiency that's lifelong? Um, I think you can argue that, you know, it doesn't matter, right? You no, know, why does it matter if they lack antibody, you just give them immunoglobulin. Um, I think it turns out actually matters a lot for patients. You know, uh, people want to know, especially when they're having family planning, is it something that they have lifelong that they need to worry about passing on to their kids, or is this like something that they just got because of rituximab? And I think another place where this would be helpful is if you admit a patient who's getting infections and you notice that they got rituximab even five to 10 years ago, it might be worth it just to do a quick check just to say, hey, you know, did they have some sort of lasting antibody deficiency because of this treatment they got five to 10 years ago? Again, I think it'll make, would, would make some big difference in someone's life. Uh, okay, so third part, the third story I want to tell you is this concept that each infection actually tells us something about our immune system. Uh, and that's had to do with our genetic susceptibilities. So, you know, the fact of life is we all get sick, right? All of us have gotten a cold at some point. Um, we admit patients with infections all the time. That's just a fact of life. But if you have a good immune system, what's supposed to happen is, you know, you'll recover from the illness. And if you encounter the bug again, you probably have milder disease or maybe you won't have symptoms at all. Um, but some scientists here actually at Mount Sinai and at Rockefeller University, they ask an interesting question. You now, what happened to those patients who get sick, but then they end up in the ICU who are really sick from it? And what if some then even pass away from it, from things that normally we do pretty well on? Do they have some immune deficiency that we should have known about to begin with? Um, so let's take a look to see what they find. So this is, uh, mycobacterium infection. Also, I used to want to do residency, we get this kind of rule out, you know, we get TB rule out, which they stay up with us for days and days. And then we always have like gone up forever to get in. Uh, and I think those patients get pretty bored. But what if you get culture to come back and you're not seeing tuberculosis, you're seeing these strange bugs that you've never even heard about. Um, so all these are basically environmental mycobacterium. So what then, you know, what do you do about it other than consult uh, infectious disease and have them uh, deal with it? Um, so these scientists actually took a look to see what's going on here. They sequenced their genes and turns out these people, usually they're healthy, but for some reason they get really sick when they get exposed to environmental mycobacterium. Or sometimes if they're from outside the US, they get really sick from um, BCG vaccine. And when they put them together, they saw a thing. And what happened actually ended up making complete sense. Um, they all have genetic defects that affect their interferon gamma production or response. You know, as we probably know, interferon gamma is very important for defense against mycobacterium. So this group of patients called Mendelian susceptibility to mycobacterium disease. You know, again, if you ever see infections from our box, it might be worth taking a look. Now, you can say that, hey, you know, these people probably were sick, you know, they probably have gotten this when they're a kid already if it's some sort of genetic defect. So what happened if we only look at adults who get really sick or who get unusual infections? What happens here? Um, I love this paper partly because I think it's one of the few papers that came out of Taiwan where I was born. Um, and I can make a difference if you're a clinician, even if you're not um, immunodeficiency doctor, you can make a big difference. So what happened is there's a group of doctors in Taiwan and Thailand 
who started noticing that there's all these adult patients who are getting, um, who look like HIV, and they'll test two or three times, and they're like, oh, they really don't have HIV, but they're getting odd infection, and they're getting mycobacterium. So they ask, what's going on here? Um, can anyone take a guess? guess? No? OK. Well, I, I won't torture you guys. Um, <laughs> So what happened is they actually collect these patients and collaborate with NIH here in the US. Um, I thought this was really cool. So this is what they look like. So usually, these are a group of people who are middle-aged, as young as 18, as old as 78, slightly more skewed towards female and HIV negative. And what they get is they get disseminated disease from environmental mycobacterium. They get opportunistic infections like cryptococcus in the bone and some of them had some weird skin rashes. And they sequenced them, didn't find anything. And people are like, oh, you know, it's not an immune problem. You know, maybe they were just unlucky, or maybe this just happens. What turns out is the case is that they measure autoantibodies. So instead of having an immune deficiency in interferon gamma, they actually have an autoimmune disease, which kind of makes sense, right? As we get older, we're getting higher and higher risk for autoimmunity. And these people happen to make autoantibody in t uh, against interferon gamma. So we actually call this a fancy term, so phenocopies of inborn errors. So basically, you have an autoimmunity that end up mimicking a primary immunodeficiency. Um, and this example actually applies to a bunch of different things. So there's a group of genetic defects that give you this chronic invasive thrush. Uh, but turns out, you can, if you look at, look at certain patients with autoimmunity, like autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome, and take the one that also have the same problem, and it ends up they actually make antibodies to cytokine called IL-17 as well. Um, and so instead of, instead of just having like autoimmune thyroid issue, they get other infectious issues. And I always take a look at immunodeficiency kind of like, you know, they're basically human knockout models of what people see in the lab. And I think these have big implications. So if you ever go into rheumatology, um, if you're treating psoriasis with something anti-IL-17, so based on our primary immune patient, it's perhaps not too surprising that you need to worry about them getting thrush as a side effect. Okay, so all these kind of all tied in together even if you're not in immunology. So this is kind of variety of what's been found to date in the last four or five years. So if you're getting like uh, mycobacterium infections, you know, non-type or salmonella, or even like a VZV vaccine reactivation, you might want to look into autoantibody against interferon gamma. Uh, if you're getting a cryptococcus infection or cardiac, the person may have autoantibody against GMCSF. And if you have really invasive staph infections, it might be worth taking a look at autoantibody against IL-6. So a lot of autoimmune disease can actually present as a primary immune issue. Um, and this is a last, uh, a last slide in this section. I'm not going to belabor this because I think we all know this. The same concept actually also applies to uh, emerging uh, or new pathogens. So we probably ask, if, in the beginning, I think 2020, if we remember, it kind of feel like a Russian roulette a little bit, right? You know, like I was like, you know, my family got COVID, they're fine, and I worry about what if I get it, am I gonna end up in the ICU? You see all these case people in their 30s, and in the ICU in the 2020, you're like, is that gonna be me? Um, and turns out the people who are young and got really sick from COVID, uh, up to 5% of them have some sort of inborn error in type 1 interferon, which is important for antiviral defense. And if you're older, uh, what end up happening, up to one in five of them actually have autoantibody against type 1 interferon which make them really sick and end up in the ICU. And this is the last slide for this segment. Um, I thought it's kind of interesting. It turns out it's not just autoantibody against cytokines. People can actually also make autoantibody against whole group of immune cells. So for the longest time, we know that if you look at infectious disease journal, this group of patients who doesn't have HIV but has CD4 lymphopenia for no reason. People never know what to do with them. And turns out a lot of these patients actually make autoantibodies against their CD4 T cells. 
So they are actively killing their own cells, and this is what in, what's causing this HIV-like uh, presentation. So something to think about if you someone if you miss someone for like HIV or if you see someone with with CD4 lymphopenia but has no HIV, let us know. We actually have a collaboration with NIH to look into these patients. All right. So very last segment, I think. One thing that I learned since I've you know, become an immunologist is that you're really only find it if you look for it. Um, so I'll give you two examples on this thing. So I think we're actually in a pretty unique setup, and I, I think we're pretty privileged. You know, we're right in the smack of 23.6 million people, so we see a lot of people from all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, and I remember I was on console service two weeks ago, and I saw this very, very nice patient and uh, explained something very complex. And at the end, I asked, you know, what question you have for us? And actually, his only question was, hey, doc, you know, when can I go home? You know, he's really worried about he has a job working in a corner store, and he's really worried about he's going to lose his job. So I think a lot of people don't necessarily have the social economic resources to really reach out the Uber subspecialist. Um, so what can we do about that? You know, we're right in the middle between Upper East Side and uh, Bronx um, and Harlem. And so can we do anything to help with people who doesn't have the resources? So this is a study that we did 10 years ago. We actually take hospital admission codes and we weighted them. So, you know, certain things like, you know, brain infections, sepsis, pneumonia, things that give us a clue that it could be an uh, immune defect. We collect them together, give them a weight, and we exclude people who have confounding factors, so people like HIV, cancer, transplant, or major surgery. And what we left was there's actually about 500 patients who were responsible for a very high amount of recurrent admissions for infections. No, they account for three, about 3,000 infections there. So we're like, hey, what's going on there? So we actually established an outreach program to say, hey, you know, you've been getting sick a lot and pretty badly, you know, you should come and take a look. Um, and 59 people came in, and I think it was actually pretty, um, pretty helpful. It turns out all the people that came in, um, about a third of them actually end up having some sort of primary immunodeficiency, so like an antibody defect, and about uh, one in five of them has some sort of a secondary immune defect. Either they were on some sort of biologics that people may need to think about more, or they have functional splenectomy, um, which causes them to get sick a lot more easily. And if you take a look at patients who benefit from this, um, uh, this approach, you know, up to 90% of them are actually from people uh, of uh, African American or Hispanic background. Um, so actually, I think now in 2023, we can actually do a lot better you know, with uh, computer-assisted technology like AI. Um, so I think if anyone's good at computer, let me know, or anyone knows some like PI here who can access large hustle of data, I do think it's worth taking a look at this approach again and see if we can really reach out to this patient and make some early diagnosis. Okay, so now I think the most common question I get from people who rotate through is, you know, when should I evaluate? When should I think about immunodeficiency? You know, we're usually busy enough. We don't have time to think about, you know, really zebra diagnosis. Um, you know, if you Google, you'll see all these recommendations out there. Like, you know, you should consult if you've got more than five sinusitis. You should consult if you get more than three bronchitis per year. Um, I actually don't like any of these recommendations, you know, Rhinosinusitis is so common. Um, probably one of the common causes would be more allergic inflammation, or they probably need to see an ENT. Um, this is my personal take. I think what's more helpful is you know thinking about this situation. You know, people who have severe diseases, who people who get sick from unusual bugs, I think that should really trigger something at the back of your mind to get us involved. That being said, though, I think you know. I think after seeing this for a few years, it's actually quite humbling. I think what I learned is that you can really, you shouldn't make uh, assumptions at the end of the day. You know, why patients who walk in at age 70 who have, you know, antibody of zero but never gotten sick before, and you just kind of 
they only found out because they got screened for celiac disease and happened to find out they have no IgA. So some people, for some reason, just can be really unexpected. And this is kind of an unexpected case that illustrate this. So this is a patient that showed up in my clinic. He's in his mid 20 and he has this very severe rash that's uh, dermatitis, that's kind of this psoriatic feature or eczematous feature. If you look at his leg and arms, um, he's actually have all this follicular inflammation. He get recurrent staph infections. And he was actually quite depressed from this because he couldn't go outside. Um, he kind of wants to like, you know, meet people, but all oh, this is on his skin, it's very revealing. Um, and he kind of had a tough life. You know, at age 12, he actually showed up in the hospital because he couldn't walk. Uh, he had so much uh, arthritis, joint inflammation in his legs. And he has tried all sorts of chronic steroid and uh, biology over the years, and none of them really helped. So when he showed up here, uh, Dr. Gottlieb from dermatology of all places actually did something unexpected. Um, he, she actually said, hey, you know, why don't we sequence your genes and see what happens here? And what turns out is that they actually have a mutation in something called SOX1. So I think of SOX1 as kind of like, um, so when our immune cells get cytokine signal, it's kind of like a ghost signal to start getting activated. And SOX1 is kind of like a break on that signal, just say, hey, calm down a little bit, you don't have to go overdrive. Um, so this patient basically has a mutation in which the break is gone. So he just get constant chronic inflammation in his skin and his joints. And we actually are pretty lucky here. We have a big group of collaborators. This is Dr. Bogoyanvik, and this is Connor Cooper, who was a Gruber, who was an MD-PhD student here. They were able to help verify for us that this mutation does indeed cause a problem in the protein. And once we know this information, we can actually do much more targeted treatment. So we can think about, you know, we know this JAK inhibitor out there now, we can basically block this activation pathway. Or we can actually block, we, if we know that they're getting super active from certain cytokines, we can maybe block those cytokines completely. Um, and that's what we ended up doing for this kid. We put him on uh, anti-IL-4 therapy because he has a lot of skin infl inflammation. We put him on IL-17 antibody because he has a lot of joint uh, inflammation. Um, and this is what happens a few months later. Um, so I think he's had it for 24 years and then knowing that with a proper immune workup, it actually made a huge difference uh, in his life. So I think my main takeaway from this talk is, you know, as you're busy going back to the floors, if you're, as you're busy emitting another pneumonia emission, you know, it's true that people get sick, you know, either from like comorbidity like diabetes or they have something else that exposes pneumonia. But once in a while, if you see a patient that you think, hey, you know, you're otherwise healthy, you shouldn't be getting this sick. You know, I would love to, as part of your assessment plan, also think why, you know, other than just giving antibiotics, think about why are they getting sick, um, and it may be worth looking in a little bit further. And I definitely have to think back myself through my residency, you know, I was doing night floats, you know, I got 10 emissions, I was just going through them. It doesn't really make me think sometimes, hey, should I have sent some antibody levels on some of them to see what's going on there. So thank you for having me. Any questions? Thank you. I think that a lot of times, you know, admittedly, these are rare disease, and I think some of the giveaway is maybe the severity. Mm -hmm. Definitely, if they have disseminated disease, well, I think it's, yeah, 
it's definitely worth it. Or if they get some other flavor, if they have, you know, for example, some of these patients get like non-typhoid salmonella, for example, because you need the same cytokine to defend against those bugs. So if they have this plus something else, or if it's very severe and something doesn't quite add up, um, let us know. And I usually also, also always say never say never, because we can always check. You know, there are pretty routine genetic tests now that we can send, or autoantibody tests that we can send. You know, at, at most it would be like a, it could even be a virtual visit for 40 minutes. They'll go to a local lab, get it sent, um, and then, you know, we may not, we'll pick up a few patients who are like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think this one's kind of interesting. This one is this story is really odd. For some reason, it's more um, it's more uh, Asian female. So if you definitely see, and it's also kind of strange. It's Asian female who grew up in Asia, who have the problem that move here. If you take the same patient population who grew up here, they don't encounter the exact same problem. So it's very strange. Um, so if you see maybe someone that. But it also happened in other ethnicity as well. But if you see like middle age onset, maybe think about autoantibody checks. Oh, yeah. So they don't always cover. It's true. Um, the out of pocket now cost is now down to around two hundred fifty dollars, um, which is still I think it could be better. But for some people, for them, um, it could be worth it. Uh, if they cannot do it, we also usually try really hard. If you have su sufficient medical records, we have had pretty good success rate. You know, if they have like a required ICU admission, hopefully someone from insurance will understand that you know it's worth looking into why to prevent another ICU admission for pneumonia. It's usually the first one I get to. Yeah, no, I think that's such a good point. You know, that's something that I will, for your first question, that's something I would love to work on. You know, I can imagine probably we can have more cross talk. I can, I can probably talk more with our microbiology lab, for example, and pick up patient that way. You know, if you get strange bugs or if you're someone that's getting samples from the ICU, you know, it's almost kind of like, you know, I think there's a lot of effort on like, you know, penicillin allergy, for example, trying to screen that. I think the same thing could also be in place for this. So actually, I would love to do that. So if you know someone here who would be interested, or maybe I should just cold call them and you never know. Um, and then I think for the, for the second comment, I think a lot of time it's your clinical acuity. If you, we use biologics so much, but if you see that someone is really not doing well on biologics, you know, it's worth help us taking a, a look. I think the one I'm aware of with the most potentially lasting effect is rituximab. For some reason, it's just really lasting. So that's one thing to worry about. And then everything else is really a risk-benefit discussion. You know, like you give them certain biologics, you know, you are giving them a form of immunodeficiency. You know, it's expected that something will happen. But 
if they get like too sick from it, you know, sometimes it's worth letting us know because maybe that's something underlying that's compounding the issue. And we can help you to maybe help select, maybe, hey, maybe this biologic is too strong. Maybe we need to think about something, a try different pathway or something more targeted. So we're here to help you like work through it. Yeah, I think we can probably update this approach. We can probably come up with a better scoring system nowadays. We can probably even have like AI take a look and then, you know, they may find something that we're not even thinking of and kind of pick up like people who's high risk and who's risk, who's worth testing. I think that could be a very interesting pilot. Um, so. Um, oh yeah, for sure, yeah. Yeah, oh, Biome is a great example, yeah. So actually, I would love to talk to people who have access to that and take a look. I know Charlotte has taken into a segment of it, but there's probably a bigger segment that we can. So Biome is basically people the genetic screening and then with ICD codes or attached to it. There's probably a different way we can take a look at this available data set, for sure. There, uh, there is a question online, not sure how long comes so people can hear it. It's very specific, but it's for oh, complication. It's like a console. So right, it's a console. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Five-year-old girl with atopic dermatitis around age one to three, huh. recent skin staph infection in different spots. Should she see an immunologist? Could it be anti-IL-6 deficiency? Um, I think that, so if you have skin barrier defect, that does give you increased susceptibility to uh, infection. So. I may not, you may not necessarily have to kind of alarm the family, but if the patient's really hard to treat, you know, if they go through the standard, like, you know, low dose bleach bath, uh, bleach bath, and then the standard dermatology treatment, um, if they still have an issue, you know, it's worth taking a look. There's a spectrum of um, immune deficiency that actually present with a severe atopy. And those people usually have a lot more other issues other than eczema, so they will have, um, you know, pretty bad um, asthma, for example, they have a bunch of food allergies. So if you kind of fit into that severe, diverse phenotype, it could be worth taking a look. I'll probably send it in there. All right, thank you for having so, me. Uh,